Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to, today, to today's event. Um, my name is Doug Rogers. I teach in the Anthropology Department, and I'm the faculty director of the program in Russian, East European, and Eurasian Studies. Uh, today is a special event, not just because of our guest, who's one of the most uh, well-known, most distinguished, and most fascinating journalists and broadcasters of the past 50 years anywhere in the world, uh, but because in a much uh, smaller and more modest way, uh, this is the first time that the words program in Russian, East European, and Eurasian studies are being uttered in public at Yale. Um, <laughs> applause is appropriate. Um, our program dates from uh, July 1st, 2018. Um, uh, and we think that the interest that we're hearing around campus and the uh, uh, full auditoriums like today are good evidence of expanding interest in uh, the study of, um, of this part of the world. Uh, so thank you for coming. Look at our uh, website, get on our newsletter. We hope to bring you many more events like this. I want to thank um, the Macmillan Center, the Council on European Studies, uh, for helping us with this event. Also, uh, and especially the Pointer Fellowship in Journalism and the Office of Public Affairs and Communication. Eileen O'Connor is somewhere here. Um, uh, thank you very much for, uh, for your partnership in this event and uh, many other events we've had in the past and, and hope to have in the future. Um, the plan for today is that I will turn things over to uh, Konstantin Moravnik, who I'm also very grateful to for suggesting uh, this program and for doing a lot of the work to make it happen. He'll introduce our guest. Uh, who will then speak for uh, a little while, uh, followed by a uh, sort of open uh, question and answer and discussion period. Uh, so without further ado, Kostya. It is my distinct honor to uh, welcome uh, Vladimir Posner to Yale. Uh, Mr. Posner needs an introduction only from, for those who are too young to remember the 80s and the 90s in this country when he regularly appeared on Ted uh, Koppel's Nightline and the Phil Donahue Show and then co-hosted the Posner Donahue Show on CNBC. At that time, he once visited Yale, so it's not uh, a welcome, but a welcome back. Uh, Mr. Posner may also need an introduction to those who are detached from contemporary Russia where he is omnipresent in the media. For the past 10 years, he has hosted a weekly show, Posner, uh, where he interviews various national and world leaders from all walks of life. Gorbachev, Sakurov, Gaidar, Shoigu, Ted Turner and Vexelberg, Hillary Clinton and Sting, Michael McFall and Ksenia Sobchak, among many others, had a chance to face Mr. Posner's thoughtful scrutiny and be judged by millions of Russian viewers. Mr. Posner's opinions on a wide range of questions from politics to soccer, from history to gastronomy and arts quickly go viral. They have become a fact of uh, Russian life to such an extent that he has been termed half seriously, half in jest, uh, the spiritual leader of the nation and its moral compass. This is despite the fact that Mr. Posner is Russian just as much as he is an American or French. He was born in France and christened in Notre Dame, grew up in the US, and came to Russia only at the age of 19. Perhaps this cosmopolitan aspect of his biography is what endears him to Russian public, tired, like any other public, of ideological agendas. Perhaps this ability to be simultaneously Russian and American and European attunes Mr. Posner to the subtleties of different perspectives and brings him one step closer to the much desired and, less, and, and no less appreciated objectivity and truth. Especially now when the gaps separating governments and nations are only widening and one side increasingly refuses to consider the views of the other. In his more than five decades in the field of journalism, Mr. Posner has done his share of partisanship and propaganda. However, this changed in the 80s when he pioneered a project of so-called space bridges or telebridges that connected Russian and American audiences. Moscow viewers named him TV journalist number one in 1989, and this high mark of recognition has never decreased ever since. In 1989, and in, uh, from 1994 to 2008, Mr. Posner headed the Russian Television Academy. 
In 1997, he founded the School for Television Excellence, a, plat a platform for an education and promotion of young journalists. He's written several books and made a number of documentary miniseries about different countries, their cultures and people. These films brought the US, France, Italy, Germany, England, Israel, and Spain closer to millions of Russian people. It is my hope that this conversation with Mr. Posner at Yale will also achieve what he has been so good at, that it will bring Russian views and opinions a little closer to our students and colleagues and will maintain what we all need now the most, a dialogue based on mutual understanding and respect. So please join me in welcoming Vladimir Posner. Quite an introduction. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to say a couple of words about who I am and what I am, notwithstanding <clears throat> what we just heard. Um, it's important that you understand that I don't represent anybody um, or anything, any organization, political, social, whatever. I represent myself. I am an independent journalist, and that's an animal that is disappearing in Russia and not only in Russia. Um, I think, uh, for me, it's important that I say that. And I hope, I'm, going, I'm not going to speak long because I was told that we would have a conversation afterwards, and I think that might be the most interesting part of it because um, you have questions or views that you might want to share with me, and I can't guess them in advance. But there are certain things I'd like to say before we have that conversation. I'd like to say, first of all, that we are at an extremely dangerous moment today. Never have the relations between Russia and the United States, or the Soviet Union, that's what it was before, been at this level. During the worst times of the Cold War, when I was living in the Soviet Union, and I remember all that very, very well. Russians were anti-White House, anti-Wall Street, but not anti-American in their vast majority. In fact, there was a kind of a warm feeling vis-a-vis -vis Americans. Today, that's different. Today, it's anti-American at the grassroots level. And there's a reason for it. Another thing that is, to me, scary is that neither side seems to be afraid of nuclear weapons. 30 years ago, those of you who are of my age certainly remember an American movie called The Day After which is about what happens to you and to your country after a nuclear strike. There was fear of these weapons as there was in the Soviet Union. There was a realization that these weapons can, and if used, will destroy our country. Today, there's a feeling when you talk to people, it's as if there are no nuclear weapons. It really doesn't seem to play a role in how we act. And the danger of a, not a deliberate nuclear exchange, but an accidental one has grown because the level of mistrust between the two countries has grown as well. There have been several times in the past when computers warned of a nuclear attack, but it never got to the real thing because people took the time to really check it out. Now, they didn't have a long time. If an ICBM is launched from Russia, it'll take about 10 minutes for it to hit the US. So you don't have, a, and vice versa, obviously. Um, so you don't have a long time, but you do have some. But my feeling is that if today those same computers malfunctioned and sit on either side that an attack has been launched, the response would be immediate. 
because the feeling is that this is what's going to happen. Not that long ago, we were all very optimistic, weren't we? Gorbachev, Gorbe, Gorbe, Russians, we're going to be friends, we're going to be. And in such a really short period of time, what, how did this happen? Why are we at the point that we are today? And I'm not saying who's to blame, because that's not a productive way of looking at things. But we should try to understand exactly what did happen. The Soviet Union, once Gorbachev took over, didn't really last very long. He came to power in March of 1985, and by December 1991, there was no more Soviet Union. It, some people say it collapsed. It didn't collapse. In a place to, called the Belovirske Pusha, which is a kind of a forest, three presidents, the president of Ukraine, the president of Belarus and the president of Russia proper, Mr. Yeltsin, decided to part company, decided to disband the Soviet Union. Now, each had his own reasons, definitely. But if we look at Mr. Yeltsin, his reason was very clear. He was the president of Russia, so he was number two to Gorbachev because Gorbachev was president of uh, the Soviet Union, of which Russia was part, the largest part, but only part. Get rid of the Soviet Union, and there's no president, and you get rid of Gorbachev. And that's precisely what he did. So no more Soviet Union, quickly no more Warsaw Pact, of course. That is to say, countries that were usually called Soviet satellites and part of a military alliance with the Soviet Union. That alliance disappeared. And so the United States had to figure out, how do we deal with this new entity called Russia? How do we deal with it? There's no more Soviet Union. What is going to be US policy vis-a-vis -vis this country? And of course, Yeltsin, also had to think about what is going to be Russia's attitude towards the United States. Um, you may remember that uh, soon after the Soviet Union ceased to exist, in I think it was February of 1992, um, Yeltsin came to the United States and he addressed a joint session of Congress. And he said, the people of Russia are offering their hand to the people of the United States in friendship to build a better world, a world without war, a world without peace. And this was exactly what the vast majority of Russians wanted. And I would even say that today, the vast majority of Russians would like to have, if not a friendship, with the United States, at least a partnership. There's no doubt to my mind that that's the case. So that was what Yeltsin wanted. And what kind of response did he get? What kind of response did Russia get? Well, the United States could have picked two ways of treating Russia. One was to say, let's treat Russia like we did our enemies after World War II. Germany, Italy, and then some of the countries that were occupied, such as France, or were not occupied, such as UK, but were really badly hurt. Let's find a way to see to it that in those countries, Nazis, fascists do not come back, and communists do not come to power. And may I remind you that in those days, the Communist Party of France and the Communist Party of Italy were very, very powerful. And that plan turned out, was called later, the Marshall Plan, which was basically a financial idea to spend a lot of money, but in a very precise way, to develop certain things <clears throat> and not to allow others to develop. 
Now, that could be the policy to adopt vis-a-vis -vis Russia. See to it that democracy begins to develop in that country. And let me say, just for the record, Russia never, in its entire thousand years, never had democracy. Completely absent. So it wasn't like something that once upon a time Russians had and then they lost, but they knew what it was. They didn't know what it was. So let's spend money on getting democracy moving in Russia and seeing to it that the communists do not get back. And that could have been one approach. The other approach was to say, for 40 years, you held a nuclear bomb over our heads. You lost the Cold War, and you're going to pay for it. You're going to be punished for what you did. And there were people who supported one view and people who supported the other in this country. Early in 1992, a document was produced in the United States by a gentleman called Paul Wolfowitz. You may know who he was. He was Under Secretary of Defense of the United States, responsible for policy. The document he produced came to be called the Wolfowitz Doctrine. Not officially, but that's the way it was addressed. It later was incorporated in something that is officially called the Bush Doctrine. That document was leaked to the New York Times, and so it became public. And what it basically said, and you can look it up, it's available, you know, just go to Wolfowitz uh, Doctrine and you'll, you'll find it. What it basically said was this. The United States should never again allow any other country to challenge it. The United States must remain the superior country. And we should tell our allies not to worry about developing their own weapons, because we will do that for them. And we must watch out for Russia, because we, can't, we don't know which way it's going to go. The bear might get up on his hind legs again and growl. Um, when that document was leaked to the New York Times, it was an outcry uh, by the more liberal, if you will. In America now, the word liberal and conservative has lost the meaning that it once upon a time had. So when I say liberal, I, I'm not sure that um, I'm saying the right word. But at least uh, many people were upset by this document. Um, Edward Kennedy said that it was an imperialist document that no country could or should accept. It was quickly, as it were, removed and rewritten by um, Mr. Cheney, not a very liberal man in any sense, as far as I can remember. And um, um, the uh, Secretary of Defense in those days, Mr. Powell. But basically, it retained that view. Russia and America must, remain, must be the only superpower. And basically, that view was the one that was accepted. It was the one that would accept it. And the attitude towards Russia was pretty much, you're no longer a superpower. You are a second-rate country. Just, just keep quiet, please. Uh, this became evident and would be evident to you if you follow the policy of the United States. Now, let's begin with going back to Gorbachev and his meetings when he was asked by several people, all of them quite important, to allow Germany to reunite and take down the Berlin Wall. And he was told by James Baker, and now this is it, not many people, I mean, when I would say this, many people would say, it's not true, it's not true. He was told by James Baker, if this happens, 
NATO will not move one inch eastward. Well, not long ago, on December 12th, 2017, the National Defense Archives of George Washington University declassified the minutes of the Baker-Gorbachev discussion, and it's there. But it's not only Baker who said that to him. There were several people did. The German leadership did, West German at those days, and so on. And finally, I'm not say, I don't know whether, whether Gorbachev could have stopped Germany from reuniting, but the fact of the matter is that they said yes and took down the Berlin Wall. And NATO stayed put. It stayed put in those days. It stayed put under Bush Sr. It stayed put during the first four years of Clinton. But in the next four years, in 1996 approximately, a decision was taken to enlarge NATO. Three countries, Poland, the Czech Republic, and Hungary. Now, I'm going to read something to you. Uh, you know who Thomas Friedman is? New York Times, old hand uh, columnist. He, uh, when this happened, this is already 19, this is um, 1998, he called up George Kennan. I don't know if you're all aware who George Kennan was, but he was one, in my opinion, perhaps one of the most brilliant minds, political minds of the United States in the second half of the 20th century, the man who devised the idea of containment of the Soviet Union rather than war against the Soviet Union, successfully did this. So, you know, a brilliant man who, uh, who established the, the, the very foundation of US policy vis-a-vis -vis the Soviet Union. So Thomas Friedman called him up. The article he published in the New York Times is called Foreign Affairs, Now a Word from X. Why X? Because in 1947, in the magazine Foreign Affairs, um, uh, Mr. Kennan had published this article about containment, and he signed it X. So he called him up, and he asked him, what did he think about this decision to enlarge NATO? Let me quote. I think, this is May 2nd, 1998. I think it is the beginning of a new Cold War, said Mr. Kennan from his Princeton home. I think the Russians will gradually react quite adversely, and it will affect their policies. I think it is a tragic mistake. There was no reason for this whatsoever. That decision, and now I'm giving you my opinion, is what really started this, this relation, what, turning it south, as you might say. That's where it all began. Because the Russian reaction, and specifically this is 1998, so uh, this is Yeltsin, late Yeltsin, was, you promised not to do this. So how do we trust you if you make a promise? I would also like you to perhaps try to um, solve a little problem. It's a, a kind of a, ma not, not ma mathematical. Take the time from when Gorbachev came to power, March 1985, to 2007, when Putin has been in power for seven years. That's 22 years. I ask you to find a single thing in foreign or domestic policies done by the Soviet Union, while it existed, and then Russia proper, that might in any way anger, irk, disappoint the United States. Let me answer that for you. Nothing. Not one thing during that period. Now, what did Russia get as a result of that? First, the enlargement of NATO. So that was number one. Then the bombing of Yugoslavia that was done by NATO, and NATO is, after all, dependent mostly on the United States, let's face it, right? 
uh, the UN did not condone this. So the bombing of Yugoslavia, that's uh, from March 24th, 99 to June 10th, 99. Then uh, Kosovo and recognition of Kosovo, although it had been part of Serbia for centuries. And there were people in Russia who said, you're letting the gin out of the bottle. Because if you do this, then there are other countries that will do the same. And Russia did the same, vis a vis Abkhazia, to begin with. Okay? Uh, Yeltsin was very angry. He made a speech. He said, and of course, this is very Yeltsin like, he said, We're not Haiti. You can't treat us like Haiti. We're a great country. We have a great past, and Russia will come back. Russia will come back. He was really, really angered. Didn't say the politically correct thing, but he spoke his mind. Uh, then finally, 2000, the year 2000, Mr. Putin is not elected, although elected, um, to the presidency. And one of the first things he does is to ask for Russia to become a member of NATO. Why not be a member of NATO? NATO was created to defend Europe, and perhaps not only Europe, from Soviet aggression, from a country that you couldn't predict. There is no more Soviet Union, and there is no more Warsaw Pact. Why can't we create an organization where we're part of it, said Mr. Putin, and act together to protect from some kind of aggression? He was told, go take a walk, basically. What about some kind of partnership or becoming part of the European Union? Again, and this is all documented. Everything I say, except when I say my opinion, is documented. You can look it up. And he said, they were, no, you know, you're too big. Your country's too big. You can't. Uh, and all the while, Russia was being reminded that it's no longer really that important a country. Now, one of the things you must keep in mind is that much like the Americans, the Russians believe that they have a mission, that their country was selected by destiny. Now, you know, my being French, I laugh at that. I laugh both at you and at them, because we French know that we're the best, and we, don't, we have no, 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 we have no mission. You know, we're the, that's it. But seriously speaking, and that's a fact. And so the sense of losing this, this, this um, aura of greatness, of being told, we don't care about you. The, uh, the reaction of the average Russian to that was one of, you're, uh, you're insulting me. You, not, you don't respect me. And so the anger, gradually, and the anger focused on Gorbachev, Many, many Russians figured, you sold the country. You don't stand up to these men, to, these, to the United States. And then the same thing for Yeltsin. You'd be surprised how unpopular Gorbachev and Yeltsin are today in Russia. Maybe 5% support them, precisely for that reason. Well, there are some others as well that have to do with economic things, but nonetheless. So now here we have Putin who, as you know, as soon as 9-11 happens, calls up Bush Jr., W., and offers his help. And yes, and does help in Afghanistan. And if you want to have your soldiers, your military people in, in Central Asia, right on our borders, be my guest. And in Georgia, absolutely. So it's not just words. You know, we, we want to fight terrorism together. 
and uh, gets nothing in, in, in exchange. So finally, in 2007, in Munich, um, speaking to the 20, the group of 20 in Munich, Putin says this. This is February 10th. I think it is obvious that NATO expansion does not have any relation with the modernization of the alliance itself or with ensuring security in Europe. On the contrary, it represents a serious provocation that reduces the level of mutual trust. And we have the right to ask, against whom is this expansion intended? And what happened to the assurance of our Western partners made after the dissolution of the Warsaw Pact. Where are those declarations today? No one even remembers them. But I will allow myself to remind this audience what was said. I would like to quote the speech of General Secretary Mr. Werner of Brussels on May 17, 1990. He said at the time, quote, the fact that we are not ready to place a NATO army outside of German territory gives the Soviet Union a firm security guarantee. Where are these guarantees? And do you know what the answer was? The answer was, yes, but that was guarantees given to the Soviet Union and your Russia. Well, what kind of a reaction would you expect? Um, Last year, I think it was, making a foreign policy speech, Putin said, our mistake was that we trusted you too much. And your mistake was that you tried to take advantage of that. That is the situation today. Now, it may seem to you that I'm blaming the United States. I don't want the word blame used. It was a mistaken political decision. It was not the Russians. It was this decision that finally led to this change in Putin's attitude towards the West, and in particular, towards the United States, which is why I say how US policy created Putin the way he is today. And the really, if you will, um, um, dangerous thing is that Russian leadership, or I should be more precise and say Vladimir Putin, does not trust the West, does not trust the United States, which makes it very difficult to move away from where we are today. So that, that's something I want to underline. So we are in now in a new arms race, which is terrible. We are in a new Cold War, which threatens all of us. The danger of an accidental nuclear exchange has grown. We no longer seem to fear that. There used to be demonstrations. You know, get rid of nuclear weapons. That's not happening anymore. The uh, possibility of a terrorist organization somehow getting a nuclear weapon has grown and to make it look like someone used it on each side, not the terrorists. So that, I believe, is something we should all understand. And finally, as someone who works in media, I would like to say that Russian media, uh, mainstream, I'm, I mean mainstream media, paints America black, Russian media, mainstream media, controlled directly or indirectly by the government, um, shows a, an extremely negative picture of the United States, US policy, and so on. And much to my surprise, mainstream American media does exactly the same thing vis-a-vis -vis Russia, which to me is amazing because this is supposed to be a free media, as differing from the Russian one. As someone who works in Russian media, I can say it's, it's hard to call it a free media. 
There are some opposition newspapers and radio, but that's not mainstream. They address a very small number of people. So there we are. I think, I think people who call themselves journalists, in my book, they're, they're not journalists. But those people have played and are playing a destructive role in creating the fear, the dislike, the distrust that the people in both countries have vis-a-vis -vis each other. And the fact that we don't seem to question our media is really quite interesting. But there it is, nonetheless. We just take it. So I'd like to wind up with a quote from a gentleman, no, I hesitate to use the word gentleman, from a <clears throat> man whose name was Hermann Goering. You all know who he was? There may be some people who are too young to know. Well, he was um, Hitler's right-hand man and he commanded the Luftwaffe, the German Air Force. And he was, of course, at Nuremberg. He was judged, sentenced to death, to hang. But he managed to get some poison, probably from the Soviets, of course, uh, since they poison people, as we know. Um, so, <laughs> so as not to be hanged. But he was um, interviewed by an American journalist shortly before he committed suicide. And here's what he said. And I think this is something that we should all remember. Naturally, the common people don't want war, neither in Russia nor in England, nor for that matter in Germany. That is understood. But after all, it is the leaders of the country who determine the policy. And it is always a simple matter to drag the people along, whether it is the democracy, or a fascist dictatorship, or a parliament, or a communist dictatorship. Voice or no voice, the people can always be brought to the bidding of the leaders. That is easy. All you have to do is tell them they are being attacked and denounce the peacemakers for a lack of patriotism and exposing the country to danger. It works the same in any country, said Mr. Goering. And I think he was absolutely right. And we are being led by our media, by our politicians, in that direction, in both countries. I remember an ad that I saw a famous uh, American actor whose name I, who, he starred in, um, oh gosh, so many movies, um, an, Afro, uh, an African American, uh, um, not a young, not, not a young, yeah, free, what? Freeman. Freeman, yes, yes. And he says, we are at war. And he does it very well, he's a wonderful actor. But he, you know, he tells you, we are at war and we must, and da 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 And of course, it's very scary. I, you know, I, there's nothing I can do about that except speak. And I speak, I'm happy to speak here today. I do this in Russia, and I'll keep doing it as long as I possibly can, because there has to be some voice raised against what's happening. We're being manipulated. You know, the way Putin is portrayed, well, he's worse than Hitler. And even, even Hillary Clinton compared him to Hitler. I mean, this is, I'm not a Putin fan, believe me. But you know, what's, what's going on here? And of course, President Trump. Well, even your own press is not too, uh, not too positive about him. But anyway. So basically, that's what I wanted to share with you. And see, I've only spoken for 45 minutes. And, uh, and I would very much like to discuss. Uh, if you, I hope you have problems. And, uh, problems. Coin, uh, uh, that was a Freudian slip, wasn't it? Uh, I hope uh, you have questions. I'm sure that you know, what I've just said, in the sense of what's happened, 
that you can't be argued about. I mean, this is, these are facts. But how you interpret them, that's a whole different issue. So uh, thank you again for, for listening, and let's, let's talk. So I am uh, acutely aware of which one of us has more experience in this kind of a uh, forum. So I, I think I will skip uh, the part where I ask the first question and open it up for, for questions and, and, uh, and comments with the following uh, suggestions and guidelines. Um, we have two microphones. Uh, please wait for a microphone. You may think that you have a loud voice, but the people behind you will not agree. So please wait um, for the microphone. Please uh, be aware of the fact that we have uh, some limited time for conversation and a lot of us, so please keep your questions uh, reasonably brief and we'll, and we'll try to keep things moving and we'll move back and forth um, from side to side. Um, so uh, I'm going to start on this side. Go ahead, sir. I'm very interested in your um, take on Russian interference. Um, I, the U.S. intelligence overwhelmingly concluded that Russia is involved in U.S. elections, and I don't think I'm over I'm over assuming in saying that the Russians are in favor of the Republicans. So I'm very interested in your take on that. Well, I think that's a, you know, a question a lot of people have. I'm happy to answer it as well as I can. I wouldn't say that the Russians support the Republicans. I mean, the Russians don't really know who the Republicans are. It's not part of their daily interest, or the Democrats, for that matter. But is this microphone working? Yes. Yeah, OK. okay but it is a fact that. Republican presidents over the years have been the ones that have achieved breakthroughs with the Soviet Union. Nixon did when Jews were allowed to emigrate. This was 1972. Um, uh, Bush did. Reagan did. While the Democratic ones, such as Carter and, uh, and uh, Clinton, um, have not been so successful. But that's it. Russians did support, including the Russian leadership, I'm certain, did support Trump. Now look, they had a choice. Hillary Clinton, uh, Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump. Hillary Clinton said that, that uh, Putin was a former KGB agent and had no soul and compared him to Hitler. Trump said, I think I can work with this man. I think we can do this. Now, yes, the Russians wanted him to win. And I think that's normal. Did the Russians interfere? Officially, Putin denies it. The Russians officially deny it. Uh, US intelligence, different intelligence, says it can't furnish the exact proof, but it is certain that they did. I've been reading just recently, you know, there was this huge, um, I don't know how many pages, a special issue in the uh, New York Times about the, you know, pages and pages with, with wonderful, um, w wonderful illustrations that are supposed to really prove, you know, like, like this, you know. This kind of thing. <laughs> this is journalism. Interesting, isn't it? Um, and when you read the article very carefully, and you ask yourself, it's not an article. It's one, two, three, four, with graphics, five, six, six pages of the New York Times. And when you read it carefully, you ask yourself, why was it? published now. There's got to be a reason for this, right? I mean, this happened a while ago. What is the idea? And what you find at the very tail end is that over the past few years in this country, the popularity of Mr. Putin has increased by 11%. And the number of people who believe that the Russians interfered 
has gone down by five. Now that's a good reason to publish something like this. And this is a very detailed, interesting um, story that doesn't furnish any proof, but it's very well done as the New York Times does this. This is just one. So I said this came out September 20th. The next one comes out in Time Magazine which is October 1st, not yet there. Big story on the same thing. But this is, again, the interference of the Russians. And then we have another story in the New York Times, September 26th. So I'm saying to myself, wow, this is like a kind of a salvo, cannons are going. And I have to ask myself, is there a reason for this? And I would ask you, you know, why now? Does this have to do with the midterm elections? I think it probably does. Now, did the Russians interfere? I think they probably did. I think they probably did. Um, was that effective? I doubt it. I very much doubt it. They didn't spend a whole lot of money, about $100,000, which is really nothing when you talk about the elections. <coughs> but they did you know, some interesting stuff you will. I, I believe that to actually think that Trump won the election because of Russian interference, you have to be very naive for that. I mean, a farmer in Idaho was influenced by Russian propaganda. I mean, I worked in Russian pro Soviet propaganda for many years. And I'm not of the highest, how should I say this? Uh, I mean, it's not that great, that propaganda. <laughs> you know? Uh, it's not something I'm proud of what I did. I mean, perhaps what I do today is because of what I did back then. You know, trying mea culpa. But um, really, was Putin the man who said, let's do this? I don't know. I can't say yes or no to that. I'm a journalist. Give me proof. Give me proof. And I'll say yes or no, depending on that. But I think, yeah, there was probably an attempt to do it. And so what? Does America ever interfere in elections? Anywhere? <laughs> Never? You know, why is, it, why is it OK for you and not OK for them? You know, that, that's a question. Well, I got an answer to that from one former CIA high-ranking gentleman. He said, well, you see, yes, we do interfere, but we interfere for good, and you interfere for bad. <laughs> so I thought, well, that's it. That's, you know. So that's how I would answer your question. I would say yes. I would not exaggerate the, uh, the result of that, the impact of it. And I would say that it's being used as a political toy, ploy, in this country now for a variety of reasons. And it only really surfaced after Hillary lost. Before that, it wasn't there. But you had to find a reason why she lost. And of course, it was the big bad Russian bear. And that's part of the course, isn't it? Let's have the next question. Uh, what is your opinion of the past Trump-Putin uh, meeting? And do you think it was for show, or do you think it's actually a uh, reason trying to better our relations? Even if it was for, sh for show, it was good. It's, it was good for, how should I put this, for public feeling. At last, these two men, one of whom is the president of the most powerful country in the world, and the other is the president of a country that has 10,000 nuclear warheads and may not be that powerful, but is very dangerous. These two men have gotten together. And that in itself is positive. Um, nothing was really achieved. But I would say that one of the important things is it seems to me <coughs> that the two men kind of like each other. And that's very important. You know, Gorbachev and Reagan were completely different human beings. I mean, completely. But they liked each other. And they achieved some really incredible breakthroughs when you think about it. 
So I think it was a good thing. I think it was a first step. Of course, here, the reaction to it was very negative because supposedly, well, you know, what, uh, what Trump said that he trusted Putin and that he trusted his intelligence. So it was kind of, how can you trust both? They're saying opposite things. And um, there was a lot of talk about the fact that he lost to Putin. What did he lose? He gave Putin the opportunity to be on the same stage with him. That's true. That's true. Did that increase Putin's stature? I don't think so. I don't think so at all. Um, and I hope that there's a next meeting. I hope there is. I hope that somehow th there will be a, an attempt to, uh, to break out of the situation that we're in now. I mean, I'm not, again, I'm not a big fan of, of Mr. Trump's, but even if he tries to do something, the Congress, the US Congress, seems hell-bent on not allowing that. And I don't know why. Now, if, if the American establishment wants regime change in Russia, wants Putin out and someone different in. If that is the aim of the people who are, who run this country, let's put it that way. That is uh, extremely dangerous. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. Russians are living worse today than they did five years ago. The sanctions are hurting. But the average Russian is saying, we're being punished for things we never did. This is not fair. This is the American bully throwing his weight around. And we'll take it. We can take it. And I think that's true. The Russians, the tougher it is, the more tough they become. They're pretty weak when things are good. No, it's true. But when things are tough, that's when they're really, you know. And I was reading this book uh, by Arthur Schlesinger, uh, Jr. It's called The Cycles of American History. And he dwells on 1850, uh, when the, you know, there were revolutions in Europe in 1848, and there was a Hungarian revolution. And the leader of that revolution was a man called Kossuth. And finally, that revolution was, and he, uh, was destroyed by the Austrians and the Russians. And so speaking in Congress, um, an American senator uh, said that the United States should interfere. This is 1850. And um, Senator Hale, and there's this quote, he said, the future historian might start off his chapter about the year 1850 in the following manner. At the commencement of this year, the American Senate, the highest leg legislative body of the world, the wisest, greatest, and most magnanimous people that ever lived, or ever will live, <laughs> forgetting and neglecting the trifling local affairs which concern their own limits, constituted themselves into a high court and proceeded to try the nations of the earth for atrocious acts of despotism. Wow. 1850, the idea that the United States has the right to interfere in other countries because they behave badly from a US or other point of view, that was from a US point of view. 1850, well then you begin to understand a lot of other things because that's what the United States has done time and time again. But when another country does that, that's not permissible. So in Syria, if the US goes in to protect the so-called, and support the so-called moderate opposition, and the Russians go in to support Saddam, not Saddam, uh, uh, 
Assad. 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 The Americans can do it. That's OK. The Russians can't. You know, where's your logic here? It's a tit for tat thing, isn't it? So, you know, that's, that's pretty much, in, in my view, the, uh, the answer to your That's how I look at, at this issue. Is there someone over on this side? Are we done? <laughs> no, no, keep going. There's uh, a question right over here. Be helpful if you would also identify yourselves before you ask your question. Okay. My name is Rob Foreman. I work for the medical school here. I used to listen to you on Radio Moscow. So. <laughs> that was a long time ago. <laughs> See the gray hairs. Yeah. Well. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but I'd like to frame it a little differently that I'm not so sure I perceive Americans to be hating what Russia did in interfering, although America has some of that attitude that you described, but disliking the fact that someone who is largely considered to be an incompetent president who does not have the interests of this country at heart is beholden to the Russians, even if the Russians, what they did was comparable to the, what the Americans have done in Central America and who knows where else. And on that basis, uh, I guess my question is, A, do you think that analysis is accurate? And B, why not, if, if not? Because I don't know that it is so much an attack on what the Russians did in 2016 as on the person who seems to be in the pocket of those who did it. Well, I would say this, that it was Kennedy who used to say, I, I'll say this to that, right? Um, I will say this, the, uh, what I said initially when I compared what Trump was saying during the presidential campaign and what Hillary was saying, it's obvious to anyone that the Russians would support Trump. It's obvious and Americans should understand that. Not because of what Trump stands for, not because he's a uh, whatever he is, not because he wants uh, the Supreme Court to be more conservative. Russians don't care about that. They don't even, it's not part of what they think. But they think about the relationship between Russia and the United States. And judging from what he said back then, the relationship could improve. And that's basically it on the one hand. On the other hand, you recall as well as I do, how many um, American senators, Amer senators, how many political figures said that the Russians were trying to destroy American democracy? <coughs> what does that mean? How so? That the aim of the Russians was to somehow destroy American democracy. There's none of that. So I can understand what you're saying. But it really is not at all, it doesn't correspond to what Mr. Putin or the majority of people in Russia really cared about or care about today. Today, there's much less support for Donald Trump in Russia than there was. People are asking themselves, who the hell is this man? He comes here and he says one thing and he goes away and says something completely different. You know, today he says yes, tomorrow he says no to the same thing. So there are lots of questions. And there's kind of a, um, how should I put this? They don't take him too seriously anymore, except that he has enormous power. My name is Alexander. I'm an undergraduate. You touched on, in the beginning of your talk, about how there's intense uh, American hatred in Russia. And just now you say that you know, most Russians would want to improve relations. Why do you think? How does that help Putin to have like uh, very bad relations with America or like a bad image of Americans in Russian minds? And also, do you think that this hatred is reciprocal? Like, is there a distrust of or a dislike of Russians in America? I think the word hatred is a bit strong. And I didn't use it. I said that the, the, relation, the, the attitude of Russians today towards American is more negative than it was 
back during the Cold War, the worst times. And I think it's, it's mutual. And I think that that's the result of uh, what the, po the politicians have said, what they've done, and what the media is doing in both countries. And I think it's an issue of political will. Because before Gorbachev came to power in Russia, in the Soviet Union, excuse me, um, the attitude was negative in this country, very negative towards the Soviet Union and the Russians, you know, the Russians, oh, the Russians are coming, you know, this, that. But as soon as Gorbachev started changing things, uh, Glasnost, Perestroika, da 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 da, suddenly he became Gorby, he became, you know, America's favorite guy. So I think that if there is a, a desire on both sides to change that attitude, it can be done very quickly. And that's why I say that we're manipulated. We are manipulated. And we all say, well, I'm totally independent. It's not true. We, get our, we, we, we make our um, decisions and we, we come to certain conclusions because of what we read because of what we see, and because of what we hear. So basically, that's it. I would, I would say that certainly the internet allows us to get a much broader picture. In fact, we could communicate with the other side via the internet. It's not happening very much, but it is a little bit. So that the, the uh, how should I put this, the ordinary citizen could do a lot to change what's happening in both countries. And it's a two-way street. And I think it's people like you, that is to say of your age, uh, they're the ones who, for me, are the reason for optimism. Because you can do this, whereas people of my age, and slightly younger, um, can do far less. So I would hope that uh, you know, what I've said today might lead you to look into this. And I don't say to anyone, believe me. Trust me, heaven forbid. Look into it. That's all I would say. So I was struck in, in both your talk and, and now your um, sort of mutual indictment of the media on both sides. And I was, I've been curious for a while about how this may or may not be different to what this picture looked like, say, in the late, in the, in the, in the mid-1980s. Well, the so difference... I wonder if you could recall, so, so just take the New York Times. I mean, I wonder if you could recall with, you know, what New York Times reporting about Russia, about the Soviet Union was like yeah. in the 80s. Yeah. And whether you see significant differences. Let me give you an example. <clears throat> Back in the 1970s, 1980s, um, all of the major television networks, which are the most powerful in the sense of uh, affecting, back then especially, affecting people's views. All three of the major networks, ABC, CBS, and NBC, had bureaus in uh, Moscow. The head of the ABC bureau was a woman by the name of Ann Garrels. Well, that was a rare thing in those years for a bureau to have a woman as a chief. Not only that, but she spoke Russian. And I'd like to tell you that the vast majority of American journalists did not speak Russian. They had interpreters. She did. And one day, when, uh, and I met her at some reception, and I was doing the show that you know, I did for Moscow Radio. Um, and we talked, and she said, you should be on US television. I said, well, you know, how does that happen? She called up Ted Koppel. You remember who he was, right? Nightline? I hope you've not forgotten. <laughs> uh, and she said, you know, Ted, instead of having all dissidents on all the time, who represent 0, 0.0 point something of the country, of the Soviet Union, she put on someone who can, can express the Soviet viewpoint and who can do it in English. So I got on. Nightline, and since I was not your typical Russian as far as the American um, audience was concerned, you know, who is this? Uh, 
I had great ratings. And so I was on again and again and again, and then on NBC and CBS and here and there. Today, that wouldn't happen. I was allowed to argue the Soviet viewpoint on American television. I was allowed to do that. Ted would invite someone from the State Department to rebut me, and very often the State Department would say, we're not going to do this because Posner's a pain in, in the what's it's, and we don't want to talk to him. That's fine. Today, I would not get that possibility to be on a major network regularly. And that's what's changed. That's what's really changed. And I have come to think that government censorship, official or not official, when the Soviet Union was official, there was an official censor. You had to go with your piece, and the censor would read it, stamp it. Censorship. Today, that doesn't exist in Russia. But of course, there's censorship when you know, the, the, the boss says, no, you can't say that, or you can't print that. So, and I'm talking now about mainstream media, right? So I call that government censorship. But there's something that I call um, uh, company censorship. And it's just as effective. And what's happened with American media, much to my regret, is that what used to be independent, you know, CNN belonged to Ted Turner. And he ran it. CBS was created by William Paley, and he ran it. But gradually, many of these very important sources were bought by larger companies. CNN, he sold it to NBC. NBC was bought by AOL. ABC by Disney. And so these very important media uh, organizations became part of huge conglomerates. And information was then very, made very different. The attitude towards what media is supposed to do changed dramatically. I asked a group of people, I paid for it actually, to try to find in the New York Times over the past three years, 2015, 16, 17, any positive article about Russia. One positive article. Didn't find any. Not one. Now I say to myself, if that isn't censorship, then what is it? I mean, there have to be people who come to Russia and say, gee, they have good ice cream, you know? <laughs> or they have great theater, and they do. And people are in, standing in line for theater tickets. And that's, that's a nice thing, right? Give a a more or less accurate, no, it's all negative. And that's the New York Times, let alone everything else. That, and it, it's t to me, it's terribly disappointing because I was, you know, I worked here for many, CNBC for quite a few years until a man by the name of Roger Ailes, I don't know if you recall who that was, he killed our program because he, we were too liberal. Just didn't renew, resume the contract, and that was that. So I know what freedom of the press is on both sides of the fence, as it were. It's a different issue. So that's what I'm saying, that we, in a strange way, corporate censorship is just as effective and sometimes far more sophisticated than government censorship. I think we're over on this side of the room, and people in the middle are also welcome to <laughs> ask questions. Somewhere, uh, I see a hand way in the back. Well, actually, you could lob the microphone. <laughs> so, um, my name is Rick Schneider. I work with Rivendell Institute at Yale. Well, where are you? Right here. Oh, okay, thank uh, you. I'm also a visiting professor, have been at Mgimo, and currently at Vushka. Yeah. So um, my question is, from your discussions, experience with uh, leaders um, in Russia, 
Do you sense any room for compromise on Ukraine? I mean, after all, the, the maybe the big sticking point right now in our relations is all of the sanctions, most of the sanctions, other than Magnitsky, of course, but the, yeah. most of the sanctions are about Ukraine, and yes. Donbass is a big problem. So yes. is there room for compromise to fix that? I, I th first of all, I applaud the question, because the key word is compromise. The key word is compromise. Um, I had asked uh, for um, the possibility to show a map. Um, uh, is that still possible, or is that not possible anymore? Mm. Uh, I, I want to answer your question uh, because I want to show something that I think is important. I asked, uh, oh my. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, uh, I asked uh, that a map of Russia with Ukraine uh, be put up on the screen, and hopefully it will take to take a couple of seconds. Okay, I'm not. Yeah, in my, I'm in no hurry. And a map of the United States and Mexico be put up on the screen. Now, um, let me go back to the Cuban Missile Crisis, 1962. Two totally independent leaders, Nikita Khrushchev and Fidel Castro, decide that it would be a good idea for Russia to deploy missiles on Cuban soil. Did they have the right to make that decision? Absolutely. Two independent countries. And Fidel Castro was not a satellite. That for sure. So, is that, oh, OK. <laughs> so they make that agreement. And the Soviets begin bringing in the, the missiles, well, the parts to assemble them. And the United States discovers this. That's not, that's not it. All right. Someone else is. And <laughs> No, no, no. And no. I, I, uh, Kennedy says to the Russians, turn your ships around or we will sink them. And if that leads to World War III, so be it. And the Russians turn their ships around. But there was a compromise not made public in this country at that time. Kennedy agreed to pull out American missiles that were deployed in Turkey in exchange. Because the Russians said, look, you have missiles in Turkey right on our border almost. You say our missiles are an existential threat? Well, so are yours. Take them out, and we will not deploy ours. That was a compromise. Now, Kennedy asked that this not be made public because it would kind of be seen as a, a loss of face and blah, blah, blah. And it wasn't made public, and then it was later on. So that was a compromise. And it, it helped avoid World War III. Well, this is not yet happening. We may, you may have to sort of ask folks to conjure in their minds, I. All right. Um, I, I will uh, do that. Yes. I, I, I think you I get, if you, if you do want that. to do So now. Um, the Russian leadership sees NATO as an existential threat. Rightly or wrongly, that's not the point. The point is that that's the way it's seen. And this is not politics. You know, why would you bring NATO closer and closer to our borders, they say. In Latvia, it's on the border. In Estonia, it's on the border. Now, Ukraine is being, is moving westward. It's a complicated issue. The United States has played a certain role in this. That's not the point. It's moving westward. If it ultimately goes into the western fold, or whatever you want to call it, then it's logical to surmise that Ukraine will join the European Union and will become a NATO member. Now, Ukraine has a border with Russia. Not only that, but 
Crimea, which was traditionally Russian, but I'm not, we can go into the, the uh, complicated thing about how, how Ukraine was Russian and was not a Russian, uh, not the point. But Sevastopol was always the base of the Navy, the Russian Navy, um, naval fleet of the Black Sea. So if Crimea remains Ukrainian, and if Ukraine becomes part of NATO, the Russian fleet won't be in Sevastopol, but the, the American Sixth Fleet might very well be there. And NATO will be on Russia's southwest border. And the Russians see this as an existential danger. And they say, we will not permit it. Now, does that correspond to international law? No. It doesn't. But when you talk about existential threat, you say, I don't care about international law, as in the Cuban Missile Crisis. You say, no, we don't give a damn how you feel. We're not going to allow this. It is my opinion that had from the very outset um, been some kind of internationally um, negotiated agreement that Ukraine would not become a member of NATO for at least the next 50 years, there would be no Ukrainian problem. Why did I ask for a map of the United States and Mexico? Well, the United States has a pretty large border with Mexico. Now imagine that you have a revolution in Mexico. That's not that hard to imagine. And imagine that the government that comes to power is not a big fan of the United States of America. And I think that too is not difficult to imagine. But since it's a little bit afraid of Big Brother, it asks the Russians to send over three or four or five divisions to be placed on the U.S.-Mexican border. Think the U.S. would accept that? So why would the Russians accept this? That's what it's really all about. Does there have to be a compromise? In my opinion, yes. And the compromise has to be that Ukraine guaranteed will not become a member of NATO. And then the compromise is that the Russians get out. We get out, but there's the guarantee. Crimea is a different issue. There could be an agreement that let's do another referendum under international supervision. Let's see what the people of Crimea want. Do they really want to be part of Russia? Or do they want to be part of Ukraine? Or do they want to be an independent republic? I know what the answer will be overwhelmingly. And so does everyone, which is why no one is even suggesting that. Because the majority of the people who live in, in, in Crimea want to be part of Russia. It's a tradition. It's existed that way for a long time. <coughs> but basically, that's my answer. Yes, you need a compromise. And if neither side is willing to compromise, well, then we're in deep uh, whatever. We're over here for the next question. Vladimir, Vladimir, здравствуйте. I can't hear you. Здравствуйте. Ah, dr are you speak Russian? <laughs> no, I'm going to switch to to English. I just wanted just to greet you in 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 Russian. Um, I've been following you for many years. Your work, um, going back to Telebridges uh, with Phil Donahue, and uh, uh, certainly uh, some of us remember uh, those days. I watched that back in the Soviet Union. Uh, I'm from Ukraine. Uh, just for the record. Um, so uh, I uh, certainly shared your view about a lot of things that you, you speak about. Uh, today, however, I'm struggling a little bit um, to accept your point of view. Um, and I can get rid of a feeling that um, it's almost like a legal defense uh, that is trying to uh, explain the bad behavior of a person uh, by the external circumstances. Um, I'm certainly not naive uh, or idealistic about the policy making in any country, including the United States. Um, and certainly I do agree that mistakes were made. Um, not being an expert in this field, it's difficult for me to really know the exact uh, chronological sequence of the events. So it's difficult to argue what was the cause and what was the effect 
uh, of what you're describing. Uh, however, in your presentation today, uh, I think you uh, certainly presented uh, Mr. Putin as a positive, peace-loving person, and I'm not sure that I agree with that assessment. I uh, don't. I know. Well, you, cert you certainly brought up a number of, of facts that presented him as somebody who was continuously on an ongoing basis reaching out to, to the world, mm -hmm. not just the United States, but uh, the West, uh, with the peace uh, mission in mind. However, his actions, um, not just vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Crimea, but overall uh, Eastern Ukraine, uh, his pretty aggressive actions in uh, uh, Syria, uh, certainly uh, don't create that position, so I think there's a, a little bit of a disconnect between uh, either that's the United States or our policymakers uh, made that, created that image of Putin as uh, somebody who is a, a, not an easy person to work with. Here we go. Uh, but certainly his actions in many ways, uh, and not just his actions, but also the aggressive tactics of, of the military, Russian military in a lot of these regions. Uh, don't support that, that, that view. Um, but to get to my question, uh, I think uh, while uh, generally if we, uh, for discussion's sake, agree to uh, accept that uh, the U.S. and uh, maybe the Western world, world contributed in a way to that image of Putin that, that you described, um, um, Putin is not only responsible for the foreign policy, policy of, the, of the Russian Federation, but also for its domestic policy, and who contributed to his image as the domestic leader of Russia, as somebody who is fairly, uh, fairly um, authoritarian in the way he runs the country. Thank you. Well, that wasn't a question, but I'll answer it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I made a point of up to 2007, and up to 2007, Putin did nothing internationally that would speak of an aggression. Nothing at all. It all happened after 2007. It happened in 2008 with Georgia, with the war. Officially, it wasn't Putin, it was Medvedev, but you know, so uh, no big difference. And then all the other things that you're talking about. But up until 2007, until that Munich speech, when he said enough is enough, you have to respect us. You have to take into consideration our interests. The, the world is not unipolar. It is multipolar. And you will have to keep that in mind. Incidentally, that's why he's so popular in Russia. Not because um, he contributed to people's living much better, although they did. But he was lucky because the price of oil was high. And so that certainly helped. But because people saw him as someone who stood up to the American bully and told him off. And that's where his popularity comes from. Russia is back. We're up from our knees, as people would say. And they have to take us into consideration. And we don't give a damn if you like us or you don't like us. But you know, Putin is our man. He is the true patriot. And that's where his strength lies. Now, if you talk about his domestic policies, I would absolutely agree with you that A, he's authoritarian. B, he has pretty much stymied the development of democracy in Russia. Uh, I do not agree with basically almost all of his policies in Russia. Not all, but almost all. I'm much more supportive of his international views than of his domestic views. Um, so I, I have no argument with you. I did not um, present, I, I don't think I did, present him as a, you know, um, a lover of peace. I was simply making the point that up until a certain moment, you could not really blame him for anything. And that, well, I say find it. Just point me, you know, say, well, in 2006 or in 2005, Russia did this and this. I, you know, I, I would say, OK, fine. I don't know what, you know, what, what's, what are we talking about here? And of course, Ukraine, with its uh, proximity to Russia, and have, uh, having been seen always as close to Russia because of the language, because of the religion, um, in a way, the Russians, 
you know, the Rus being where Russia was born uh, in Ukraine. So the fact that Ukraine would leave very painful to Russians, as it would be in, you know, in other countries. But um, that certainly does not, how should I put this, that certainly does not um, uh, uh, make Putin blameless in what's happened in Ukraine. So I have no argument with you at all. Uh, but because of the mistakes that were making, in my opinion, that were made, you have now a man who has a very different outlook than he did. Um, how many years ago now? You know, and that's too bad. I think that there was a huge window of opportunity, and it was missed. And it's too bad for everyone. I see a hand right up here. Um, hi, uh, my name is Anastasia. I'm from Moscow. So I grew up in Russia, but I, um, I've lived in the U.S. now for five years. So um, we've talked a lot about Putin and how powerful he is and um, he has international policy. But, you know, being a Russian myself, I ask myself, is there a future for Russia? Should we hope for anything better? Should we, because, you know, now I feel like there is a big division in terms of um, what people think. Like some people just think Putin is everything, all, we have, all we've got, and there is no other future for us. But then, of course, with Navalny being in the picture, and I know you're not the fan of him. <laughs> no, I'm not. But, um, you know, except for him, of course, there might be someone else. But my question is, should we hope for any improvements in terms of, like, for us, for Russians? Should we hope for the future for Russia, or should we just practice our American accent and forget about it. <laughs> well, you know, um, when you ask that question, I would have to ask, well, what do you mean? Um, what would you like to change? What is it that, that makes you ask that question? And my answer to that is, of course, there's a future. And the future is, well, let me back up a little bit here, the main problem from my point of view in Russia, is that the leadership, all the leadership, is Soviet. All the people who are at the head of politics and all the rest of it, they're all Soviet. They were born in the Soviet Union. They went to Soviet schools. They were members of the Young Pioneers. They were members of the Young Communist League. They were members of the Communist Party, most of them. They are, um, they are, they were created, formed by a system that no longer exists. They're trying to run a system that they really don't know anything about. And they're not very good at it. But whatever they do is based on the mentality that they have. And that mentality is a Soviet mentality. And there's not much you can do about that. That's the way they were brought up. And you can't say, well, where are the others? Because there are no others. And what I say is, in my opinion, uh, the hope is that people who were not born in the Soviet Union, who were born afterwards, that is to say the next generation and the generation after that, that's when you will see real change. And you have to have patience. Now, I have no doubt that Russia is a great country. And you know, during the worst times, like the Tsar Nicholas I, during those years, Russia's greatest literature developed. So you know, it's not that it's not just, you can't just look at it from that side. I certainly have hope. I won't see it. Not at my age. It's going to take another 20, 30 years. But in all countries, for democracy to develop, it took over 200. And I guess there were people back then saying, gee, do we have a future? Because there are all kinds of things. You had slavery in the United States less than 200 years ago. I mean, come on. Just, uh, you have to look at it realistically. So my answer to you is yes. I absolutely do believe it. But it's going to take time. And you cannot do anything about that. Except that if you're young, 
you can look forward to a change that is inevitable because those people will disappear and it'll be your ball game. As a Yankee fan, I know what I'm saying. <laughs> Vladimir Vladimirovich, uh, I'm here. Here. Over there. there. Oh, yeah. okay. Uh, uh, I'm a father of uh, Yale undergrad. My name is Oleg. We met 16 years ago in Kazakhstan. We spent a couple of days in the media business. Remember that? Uh, but um, the question that I have, um, and uh, you know, we had very interesting discussions 16 years ago about what made my family move to America from Odessa, and um, you know, uh, and I, I actually I thought a lot about it, and now I know my answer. And uh, but back then, um, I believe I told you the story that about my father, who really. Uh, you know, after the conflict in Transnistria, that was like 100 kilometers from Odessa, when people all of a sudden started killing each other. Um, you know, geopolitics, yeah, we all understand that. Tit for tat, we understand that. Um, you know, United States and Mexico, Russia and Ukraine, southern border, NATO fleet in Sevastopol, we all understand that. But with people going and killing each other right now in Donetsk, people who lived on the same street. It's not, it's not even Karabakh. It's not like even Armenians and Azerbaijanis who had some ethnic conflicts, right? They had some, you know, religious differences. But whatever is going on in Donbass right now, when neighbors are killing neighbors over nothing, I mean, do you really think that that whole issue of Ukrainian language is like really pressing there? That or, or these stories that were made up about, you know, Western Ukrainians, Banderas, uh, you know, Nazis, who's going to move in, who's going to, you know, how do we stop that? How do we stop people from killing each other in situations like that? Because, you know, they can meet up in Minsk. They can do whatever, you know, they can make agreements, they can disagree, you know, better than me about you know, money interest and, and, and kleptocracy that is so omnipresent in Russia and Ukraine and everywhere. But how do we stop that? How do we stop, how can United States and Germany and Russia get together and stop brothers from killing brothers? Well, you know, um, if I had the answers to all of those things, I probably would be in a different job. No, I, seriously. I mean, I, I, ha I can't tell you how to solve uh, the world's problems. And, you know, people are killing each other in many places. In Africa, for instance, brother is killing brother and so on. And this is going on everywhere. But I would say that if the leaders of Russia, of Ukraine, of the United States, of Germany, were actually asking that question, that question they were asking. I think they'd find a way to answer it. But I don't think they're asking that question. I think they're asking very different questions. And they have very different aims. And that's why this is going on. So I, it, to me, the answer is pretty obvious. How you make people do that, that's a different question. Why is it that egoistic, uh, geopolitical interests take first place over these things? That's the real question. And when you say we understand, I don't know who you're talking about. Most people don't even know, you know, in this country, where Georgia is, for instance, except the state of Georgia. <laughs> Most people are really, really, and in Russia too, I mean, there's, there's a, the, the, the level of, of knowledge is lower than, uh, uh, than the doorstep, as they say. So there is no effort. And the media does not play that game at all. It doesn't say, how do we stop? It says, they are to blame. And that's it, and on both sides. So I think the only way to stop it is for us to talk make our voices heard. 
And that's not easy. And sometimes it's dangerous. But again, if, you know, did I ever, no, of course not. There was a guy by the name, his last name was Niemöller. He's a German um, who fought during World War I. He was a, the, the youngest Japanese U-boat commander, or the U-boat, as they were called, submarines. And when Germany lost the war, he was totally crushed by it. And he became a priest, Protestant priest, in Hamburg, and very anti-war. And as he, grew, he, as he uh, uh, went up the, the ladder, as it were, Hitler did too. And Hitler became the head of Germany, and he became the head of the Protestant church in Hamburg at the same time. And he spoke out against war, and finally he was arrested, and he was sent to a concentration camp. But he <coughs> survived. And when he came back, he wrote a book. And in that book, there's a passage that I know by heart, because I think it's one of the most important and powerful things I've ever heard. He wrote, when they came for the Jews, I didn't say anything, because I'm not Jewish. And when they came for the communists, I didn't say anything, because I'm not a communist. And when they came for the trade union members, I didn't say anything, because I'm not a member of the trade union. And when they came for the Catholics, I didn't say anything, because I'm not a Catholic. And when they came for me, there was no one to speak. And I, feel, I very much feel that way. If we don't speak out, well, however we can, and not irresponsibly, and not to say, oh, look who, you know, look at me, but rather with this understanding that it's our, it, it's our human duty to do this. Well, then, and yet we keep saying, well, they should do it. That's certainly very Russian. They should do it. And if they don't, then what? So that's, really, that's my view. And it's an idealistic view, perhaps, but that's the way I look at it. OK. Hi, I'm here. So my on name the, is the left. here. Uh -huh. um, coincidentally, I'm also Anastasia from Moscow. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of us here. Um, I'm a PhD student at Yale. So you started your talk by outlining two strategies the US could have taken towards the Soviet Union. Towards uh, Russia towards Russia after the Soviet Union collapsed and presented this as a cornerstone of the situation we have um, right now. Yeah. So if we hypothesize, uh, with your knowledge of Russian politics, economy, you know, the Soviet mentality that you mentioned, um, do you believe that some version of Marshall Plan could have ever changed anything? Well, you know, that's the question that regardless of how I answer, I can't prove it, because it didn't happen. So it's kind of, as you say, it's very hypothetical. But do I think that that would have been better than what they did? Yes, clearly. Clearly it would have been better. To what extent it would have succeeded, who knows? I don't know. But I do know that when Gorbachev announced Glasnost, the media in Russia changed dramatically. And I think nobody would argue with that. Dramatically, overnight, it became a different kind of media. During the Soviet times, 40 million people tuned into the Voice of America in Russian, the BBC World Service in Russian, the Deutsche Welle in Russian, because they were not getting, in their own media, information that they were getting on these wave, uh, you know, and, and the Russians tried to block that. The Soviet government did. Spent trillions of rubles trying to block that. But people listened nonetheless. As soon as Glasnost came in, they stopped listening. They were getting it from their own source. They were getting the information. People know exactly when they're getting it and when they're not. Or usually they do. So that's one example of how quickly things changed. So I do think that had there been this attitude, let's help them. Let's help them become democratic. I do think that it would have been a positive, uh, that the result would have been positive. I can't tell you how positive. So in, that's you know, my hypothetical answer to your 
hypothetical question. I think we have uh, two more, uh, time for two more questions perhaps, over here. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, my name is Asia. I'm from Yerevan, uh, Armenia, right there on the map. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, it is tiny, but see, it's still you, there. You see it over there, right? That tiny little country that says Armenia. Yes. Um, okay. So I'm a doctoral student and I study genocides, but today I'm going to ask you a question. What? Genocides? Wow. Yeah, a lot of fun. Um, <laughs> but today, today I'm uh, going to ask a question about current developments uh, that happen right next door to Russia uh, and are very connected to what you talked about, about speaking, uh, out about speaking uh, the new generation that can change, the generation that maybe is, does not have the Soviet mentality can change or may be the change. Yes. And uh, something like that recently happened in Armenia. No one ever expected that peaceful demonstrations in such a tiny post-Soviet landlocked country could lead to uh, change, which was um, the collapse of the old rule and yes. establishment of the government, which is totally and fully supported by the people. Yes. And uh, the funny question that I always hear when I discuss this uh, with uh, students or uh, at conferences is how come Russia did not intervene into these developments in any way? Uh, and uh, I would really appreciate your opinion um, in this, uh, like h how come that Vladimir Putin uh, did not really respond in any visual uh, way to this development. And how would, was this even, or was it uh, observed, seen in Russia? Because it was next door, it was a big change, and some people were even speculating uh, how this could serve as an example for other countries to topple their governments, etc. So, thank you. Well, one reason might be that perhaps Putin isn't quite the man you all think he is. <laughs> you know, that's a possibility. I'm not insisting on it. Um, Another reason might be that the new leader of Armenia never expressed an, any anti-Russian sentiment. On the contrary, said we are in an, an independent country, but look where we are. Yeah. And we've always had very close ties with Russia. And we want to have close ties, economic ties. There was no, absolutely no sense of, of um, enmity. On the contrary. And it was the people, there was no doubt at this time that it was the people who spoke out. You know, Armenia is really a very small country. What's the population now? That's right. Three million. Three million, and there was a million people that came out. Can you imagine? Thirty percent of the entire population comes out in the streets. You can't ignore that. And that's another reason. But the very question, why didn't Putin interfere, reflects the way people think about it. Because that's the way he's been depicted. So, you know, that's, that's, my, that's my answer. Incidentally, uh, well, no, I'm not, I'm not going to go into that. Uh, <laughs> one more question, you say? I think one more. Yeah, we'll try to wrap up by six. So okay. um, we're back on this side. If there's, I see a hand right next to you, below you. Um, hi, I'm a master's student in European and Russian studies. Um, I guess my question is about the poisoning in the UK earlier this year. <laughs> Finally. <laughs> Sorry. Finally. <laughs> um, is there a way for us to respond to that strongly um, that doesn't escalate the kind of confrontational paradigm? Yeah. You know, when, um, when um, this took place in Salisbury, I was shocked, and I tried to figure out for myself some kind of logic. Now, you know, why, who would do this and why? Now, you know, 
let's forget about the child. I mean, she's like, you know, she, she didn't do anything. Screw Pop. Um, he was a military agent, right? He, he worked for the former GRU, not for the KGB. Putin worked for the KGB. He worked for the GRU, which is military intelligence. And they can't stand the, the KGB, and the KGB can't stand military intelligence. That's normal competition. So, and he betrayed his country, let's face it, right? He went over to the other side and began to work for British intelligence. <clears throat> and he was caught, and he was tried, and he was sentenced to 13 years. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with what happens to spies who, who, who turn against their own country and are then caught, well, in wartime, they're shot. But in peacetime, well, it's usually something like 30 years, 25. 13 is a weird sentence. Not only does he get this rather short sentence, considering, but he's exchanged for Soviet excuse me, Russian spies who were caught. Now, if he was exchanged, that means that he really didn't know anything at that point. He was, no, he was no danger to the Russian side. So, you know, let him go and we'll get ours back. Now, if Putin, now Putin doesn't like traitors. Who does? If Putin had wanted to kill him, he was in prison. It was easy to do it. And you could say that he had a heart attack or that he committed suicide or whatever. There was no problem killing him when he was in jail in Russia. But they let him go. They exchanged him. They could have exchanged someone else. They exchanged him. What sense would it make to poison this man under those circumstances? I mean, logically. Putin is anything but stupid. It's not stupid. It's very risky. The risk of somehow this being found out is always there. Why do it? This is not a, a dangerous person. He can't do anything. He can talk about what he knows, but it's, it's over. So I try to find, I'm not saying he didn't do it. I'm saying I'm trying to find some kind of logic. Logic, not emotions logic as to why Putin would be involved in something like that. All right, it's not Putin. It's one of those lower, you know, one of the GRU people who think that Putin would like it if they did it. But would Putin like it if it was discovered? No, of course not. They'd get their head chopped off. So why would they risk it? They're not going to get decorations for doing it, because if Putin had ordered it, then yes. So why would they do it? So to me, it really remains a mystery, because it's stupid. It's counterproductive. It doesn't do anything positive at all. So am I denying anything? I'm not denying. I'm saying, give me proof. Please, just show me. Yes, there it is. Now, this interview, did you see it? The interview of Rita, what's her name? Some, uh, Simanyan with those two, jur uh, those two people. Did you see it? It was one of the most uh, unprofessional pieces of work that I've ever seen. It was just, you know, I thought, what, who, why? Uh, and it happened, you know, the day before that, Putin had said, uh, these two men should go to the media. And so they come the next day, they're there, you know. <laughs> it, it's laughable, except that it's not. Not really. So I would say to you, that whole story is disgusting. I find it hard to believe that Putin's the initiate, it, initiated it. I really do. But somebody did. There's no doubt about it. Uh, now, I've heard a, a really nice story. You know, that, that uh, Mr. Skripal uh, in Britain, every time he'd meet with his um, handlers, as they call them, he, he would be paid a certain amount, not a lot, you know, 5,000 um, pounds or 7,000 pounds 
or if he felt he had something really interesting to say, 10,000 pounds. But again, he was of no real interest. So I'm thinking, and now this is John le Carré, right? <laughs> I'm thinking British intelligence gets together and says, we don't need this guy anymore. And he's costing us money with him. And he's not giving. Now, why don't we? And make it look like it's Putin. Well, that's brilliant, chap. You should do this, you know. So British intelligence poisons the guy, and the whole thing works this way. It's not impossible. I kind of laughed at myself when I came up with that one. And I'd like to talk to Mr. Le Carre and see how he thinks. Incidentally, if you've not read his last two books, uh, The Pigeon Tunnel, which is a story of his life as a spy. And the other one I forgot, Legacy of a Spy. Um, he writes with total disgust about that profession that he was in for so long. I mean, really. Um, so, you know, there it is. I, my answer to you is I, I just don't know. It's such a weird thing. It really is. I see no reason for it. It's just, just invading another country I can explain, right? But this I, I don't know. It makes no sense. One day we'll know the real, the real thing. Oh, incidentally, Salisbury, I don't know if you've ever been there. I was there. Uh, I, I shot a documentary about England. And so you know why I went there? Not because the steeple is, I don't know how many feet high or something. Uh, I have no idea. It's a, it's a beautiful. Uh, Beautiful church, actually. But um, it's because they have there one of the three original copies of the Magna Carta. And that's the beginning of real democracy in the West, well, if, you count, if you don't count the ancient Greeks. And I really wanted to see it. And they brought it out. And I can't tell you what a, you know, when you look at that, and you say, what was it, 1215? And they were already saying, you can't put a man in prison without proving that he's committed a crime. And you have all the kings and queens and all of that. It's amazing. That's why I went there. These guys didn't even know it was there, right? <laughs> they went to see the steeple. I mean, come on. All right. Unbelievable. Uh, I want to thank, let me thank everyone for, for listening to me.